Uh, good evening, uh, everybody, and welcome, both to those of you in Greenway and those joining us online. Uh, my name is Scott Goodman, and I'll be chairing the session tonight. The topic that we are presenting tonight is disclosure in the equity division, and in particular the operation of Practice Note EQ11, which is about to uh, enjoy its ninth birthday. This is part of our Litigation Essentials series, and as with previous presentations in this series, we invite you to ask questions along the way, should you wish to do so. Uh, for those of you who are online, if you're on Starleaf, simply hit the raise hand button. And for those on YouTube, please type and send your question via chat box. And by either of those methods, uh, we'll be able to answer, or at least receive and hopefully answer, uh, the questions that you have. Tonight's presentation will be delivered by two of our outstanding juniors, Dinesh Ratnam and Michael Connor. Both Dinesh and Michael have broad commercial and equity practices and years of experience in the equity division. First as solicitors in leading commercial litigation firms and obviously since they came to the bar, Dinesh in 2015 and Michael in 2018. And with that introduction, I'll ask Dinesh to come up and present uh, the first half of the presentation and he will take uh, any questions, as I said, on the way through um, and no doubt at the end of his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Before we get to the elements and the operation of the practice note, practice note 11, I want to speak briefly of its origins. Uh, so that the legal concepts that Michael and I will speak to can be better understood. Some of us will remember, and some of us uh, will know the terms uh, prior to 2012. Let's bog them down in discovery, or let's just issue categories of documents and we'll find something in there for sure. Can I reassure you that those terms are not so endorsed by the practice note, as we will soon see. Since 2012, when the practice note came into effect, the court has since long moved from its approach of ordering general discovery prior to the filing of evidence, as it was typically done pursuant to Rule 21 of the Uniform Civil Procedure Rules. The old practice of permitting general discovery and parties having to disclose uh, in answer to not well articulated categories of documents was the culprit in wasting parties' times and effort in complying with discovery orders uh, before the service of evidence. This, of course, was the genesis of causing the introduction of Practice Note 11. Often than not, prior to 2012, before Practice Note 11, parties on the receiving of end of discovery orders were forced to undertake tangential uh, crusades in having to locate unnecessary documents, documents which bore no relevance to the proceedings whatsoever, uh, distracted uh, solicitors and distracted their clients in having to undertake burdens and discovery obligations in circumstances where uh, they were distracted from narrowing the issues in dispute or focusing uh, on the real issues at hand. Uh, and often that came as a cost to one party, and that was the litigants uh, to the proceedings. And as we know, as most of you who are tuned into this here and uh, by video link, will know that discovery when it is ordered is a very essential part of litigation and it happens to be one of the most expensive components of litigation. Typically prior to Practice Note 11, courts observed 
that parties tended to frame their cases around documents. Justice Sackar in Sky Mesh made the observation that the practice note is an attempt to streamline discovery, uh, being the change in practice from previously ordering general discovery before evidence. His Honour said the previous practice of ordering general discovery produced the result uh, of parties disclosing documents that did not have any relevance or otherwise resolve the ultimate issues before the court. His Honour further observed that the parties are now forced early on to apply due consideration to the strengths and weaknesses of the case rather than filing pleadings and then later working out the case after production of documents. Similarly, uh, Justice Bergen, as she then was, as her honour then was, uh, remarked in Armstrong that the practice note requires proofing of witnesses at a very early stage of the proceedings. This will in turn force clients and witnesses to turn their mind to relevant documents crucial to the case uh, for proper assessments to be made by solicitors. And the assessments which we can all draw from that is that solicitors will be in a better position to assess the weaknesses or strengths and that will determine how early on settlement uh, uh, would, um, would take place at, at a particular stage of the proceedings and preferably obviously early on so that parties didn't have to incur costs in having to file uh, evidence. The other assessment that solicitors could make is determining which part of their case was stronger and abandon the weaker parts of cases. Um, as we may typically know, the kitchen sink approach, uh, and to avoid that uh, discovery in the form of uh, practice note 11 would assist in that regard. So with the brief understanding of how we got to practice note 11, let's look at its elements. And there are three elements, essential elements, of the practice note. The first being the court will not make an order for disclosure of documents until the parties to the proceedings have served their evidence unless there are exceptional circumstances uh, necessitating disclosure. The second element is that there will be no order for disclosure in any proceedings in the equity division unless it is necessary for the resolution of real issues in dispute in the proceedings. Uh, I'll speak to those two matters shortly. Uh, the third, third element is any application for an order for disclosure, consensual or otherwise, must be supported by an affidavit setting out specified matters, including the reasons why disclosure is necessary for the resolution of the real issues in dispute in the proceedings. And uh, my learned colleague, uh, Michael Connor, will speak to those um, practical uh, tips when he gets to his feet. So <clears throat> let's look at exceptional circumstances. The objective of the practice note is to compel the plaintiff and the defendant to first serve their evidence and serve any documents they intend on relying so that the real issues in the proceedings are confined not only to the pleadings but also to the evidence. With the objective of the practice note, and if there, there is a party that wanted to obtain an order for discovery before serving evidence, the court must be satisfied that there are exceptional circumstances necessitating disclosure. The authorities are clear on this. The practice note is not there to prohibit disclosure. It does not set out any uh, criteria as to what exceptional circumstances are, and I can assure you, having to prepare for the CPD today, I've looked at a raft of authorities in an attempt to find an authority that will uh, usefully set out a host of exhaust or an exhaustive list of those exceptional circumstances and there is uh, not one authority that will do that. Um, it is not prescriptive by its definition and Justice Stevenson in Baseline Constructions uh, uh, usefully set out in a passage um, that uh, his view, his honour's view on what exceptional circumstances was. And his honour said, as a matter of language, something is exceptional if it is out of the ordinary or unusual. 
To my mind, the exceptional circumstances referred to in paragraph four of the practice note must be circumstances that are not normal or usual. They must be something out of the ordinary. They need not be unique, but however one characterizes them, they are not exceptional at large, but exceptional because they necess necessitate disclosure. So with that said, and without uh, any exhaustive list of what exceptional circumstances are, I've done my best to isolate for you uh, the common, uh, uh, co uh, the common uh, examples of exceptional circumstances. Uh, I've picked three. I know Michael will be addressing you on one of those, but the common common ones that tend to come up are as follows. Uh, Justice Ball and Naaman uh, concluded that an exceptional circumstance is where information necessary for one party's case was solely within the knowledge of another, and on that basis, that would be classed as or deemed except an exceptional circumstance. Justice Bergen uh, in Manning uh, concluded that if a party was unable to serve its evidence without certain documents, then that would also constitute an exceptional circumstance. The third example that I refer to is uh, avoiding having to serve charges of evidence. And that comes, <coughs> uh, that example comes from the case of Skyscanner, uh, a judgment delivered by Justice Slattery in the context of expert evidence. And His Honour uh, observed that it would be inefficient to have an expert if uh, complying with practice or observing practice note 11 to file and serve an affidavit and that affidavit or report be incomplete and the expert identify uh, the need for additional documents to complete the report and upon production would need additional time to serve a further report and that would then of course cause the parties to have to serve tranches of evidence uh, in respect of expert evidence and his honour uh, concluded that an exceptional circumstance would be if the court could be satisfied that if the expert had the need uh, for documents and it would produce the result of one report, then that would be an, an example of exceptional circumstances. So you've jumped the hurdle <coughs> of exceptional circumstances, but you're not done yet because disclosure will be ordered only when it is necessary for the resolution of the real issues in dispute. In my view, uh, it would be an incorrect approach to simply frame your evidence in support of an application by simply uh, adducing evidence of relevance to satisfy the element of uh, necessity. And uh, why I formed that opinion is uh, having regard to Justice Ward's observation in Reinhardt, which Michael will speak to, uh, where Her Honour said that relevance to an issue in the proceedings may not itself lead to the conclusion that documents in question are necessary for the resolution of that issue. So with that said, most of the authorities tend to approach the element of necessity by asking this question. Is it reasonably necessary for disposing of the matter fairly or in the interest of a fair trial? And that uh, formulation, as it's put there, uh, tends to be cited uh, in most authorities by reference to Justice McDougall's, uh, uh, as his honour then was, Justice McDougall's observation in Leighton. So, having spoken to you about necessity and exceptional circumstances, Let's approach those concepts by reference to a detailed example. And the example that I want to speak to is the case of Mempol, uh, a decision by Justice Black. And this is a case where the plaintiff brought an application seeking relief pursuant to Section 233 of the Corporations Act. And the plaintiff asserts or asserted that the shares that he held in certain companies was purchased or sold by, by him to a number of defendant, defendants at an undervalued price 
in 2009. And claims were made by the plaintiff that uh, representations were made to him about the value of shares. They were mis misleading. Uh, the, there were misrepresentations. There were breaches of director's duties. And the plaintiff asserted that if he could satisfy the court that there were those breaches and there was a misrepresentation, then he would be entitled to compensation under 233 of the Corporations Act. And that compensation would have been the value, the, the value of the shares that uh, he received against what the true value of the shares should have been. And with that, Justice Black observed the plaintiff to make his case out for exceptional circumstances effectively needed to prove two things. Firstly, uh, the plaintiff lacked the relevant information. And secondly, the plaintiff established uh, the content of that information. And His Honour uh, identified in the judgment that the plaintiff had usefully set out in the evidence that there was an inequality of information between the plaintiff and the defendant, such that the material was all the material that was required as the form, in the form of disclosure was all held with the defendant. And in support of uh, the application, the affidavit material set out a host of things, which included the plaintiff was not given notice of directors or shareholders meetings of the relevant companies, and the plaintiff did not attend such meetings. The plaintiff trusted his business partners and advisors. Despite requests made of an accountant, a number of defendants uh, deflected requests for financial information, and the plaintiff had no reason to believe that the value of the shares in the companies was other than what he claimed was represented to him when he sold those shares in 2009. Taking those matters into account, uh, Justice Black said it was not for the court to determine uh, those matters when the application was brought, and, it, and his honour observed that it may not be made good at trial, but the evidence that was presented before his honour on that application uh, identified the evidence uh, and identify, identify the evidence in the context uh, the plaintiff contended information was not known to him, which was necessary to properly value the shares, and it was those shares that were sold at undervalue based on misrepresentation. So let's look at the flip side. When discovery is likely not to be ordered pursuant to uh, practice note 11. The first example I've given you is the most obvious, it goes without saying, uh, is the failure to comply with the practice note. But that is put in the context of an evidentiary nature and I know Michael will be giving you some tips about that which hopefully um, uh, you'll be able to be guided as to formulating the evidence that will need to be made um, so that your application will be successful um, in, in, in obtaining discovery pursuant to the practice note. But in Phelan's fisheries, Justice Black observed uh, the affidavit supporting the application for preliminary discovery, for, uh, for discovery under the practice note, set out a, a, an explanation why it took so long to bring the application, which is on a considered uh, was satisfactory, but the evidence did not go on to explain why disclosure was necessary for the resolution of real issues in dispute in the proceedings, and implicitly to relate that explanation to the classes of documents as which disclosure was sought. That, His Honour said, should have been done by reference to the pleadings, and that evidence didn't do that. His Honour declined to order discovery in those circumstances. Next example is just because there is a par partial admission in the pleadings does not mean that you will get uh, discovery pursuant of the practice note. In SkyMesh, the defendant admitted a claim by the plaintiff in relation to defects in respect of certain goods. It was contended by the plaintiff that access to the documents disclosed might somehow affect the, uh, or affect the reduction of the issues at trial. Justice Sackar rejected that submission uh, as a basis of exceptional circumstances. 
his honour said the plaintiff bore the onus to precisely articulate the type and incidence of the defects and ultimately quantify where the loss is said to have been occasioned by the defendant. The fact that a concession was made in the pleading, his honour observed, may have only gone to cause some commercial resolution of the proceedings at an early stage or otherwise limit the length of the trial, but it was by no means justification for ordering discovery early on in the proceedings. Uh, a familiar example, which most of you will be uh, aware of, particularly in the context of subpoenas and notices to produce, uh, is that the category is burdensome. Now, the typical approach that uh, the court tends to uh, take is a, an approach pursuant to Section 56 of the, uh, of the uh, Civil Procedure Act, uh, where rather than rejecting the entire category, the court may well simply limit the category. Uh, an example of that was in Grazier's case, where the plaintiff sought a raft of financial material uh, in, to establish the terms of a joint venture agreement. Justice Leeming there uh, rejected uh, a host of the financial material sought and simply limited the scope to financial accounts uh, for a period of uh, some years from 2013 up until when the joint venture um, uh, was um, entered into uh, rather than exposing a party to have to put on uh, uh, or disclose a host of its financial material. So in that respect, his honour uh, declined to grant dis discovery of those um, 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 those categories. Another example is the familiar term chain of inquiry, where evidence does not establish exceptional circumstances or that it is necessary for the resolution of real issues. It is safe to assume that broad requests for discovery amount to what Justice Adamson described in CBA uh, and GOTA as a chain of inquiry discovery. And that simply put is where a party has failed to narrow the issue in dispute and hopes to simply find something that it cannot articulate that they are looking for. And that obviously is impermissible pursuant to the practice note. Uh, the last example that I want to speak to is uh, the documents do not reflect the pleaded case. And in pure nature, this case involved an application by the plaintiff to amend its statement of claim and simultaneously the plaintiff also brought an application seeking discovery pursuant to the practice note. Justice Black was critical of the plaintiff's application in that it sought discovery of uh, documents in relation to a proposed amended pleading where leave had not yet been given. Uh, despite the fact that leave had not yet been given, his honour uh, ultimately concluded that the paragraph by which the plaintiff sought uh, to satisfy the Court of Exceptional Circumstances in granting a particular category, that paragraph in the Statement of Claim was rejected. And on that basis of the rejection of that paragraph, discovery in respect of that category was rejected. His Honour also observed in that case that the evidence that were brought by the plaintiff uh, was non-compliant with the practice note and uh, declined to order discovery on that basis. And his honour also cited Phelan's fisheries in that respect as well. Uh, well, that is all I wanted to speak to. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm more than happy to take them now. Otherwise, I'll hand over to Michael. Um, he'll take you through some, well, I think someone here. Um. Dinesh, to what extent can you just rely on the pleadings and the written submissions when you're making out exceptional circumstances and um, necessity? Uh, I would be very cautious about that. Um, uh, the case that I just spoke about, Phelan's uh, fisheries, Justice Black was very critical that whilst one aspect of um, uh, the affidavit was covered, it, it failed to address um, the most critical feature, which is exceptional circumstances and necessity. And uh, what is so obvious is that um, paragraph six of the practice note does say that your exceptional circumstances and necessity needs to be formulated in the affidavit. But in terms of uh, submissions, which um, 
can support the application, uh, that tends to be mainly useful in the context that uh, once you have your application supported by the affidavit, um, that affidavit can be used in connection with the pleadings to justify where your um, exceptional circumstances come into play, but more relevantly um, uh, to answer Justice McDougall's uh, formulation, which is how does the uh, how do those documents go to the resolution of the real issues? Uh, another question. Um, you mentioned paragraph six of the practice note. One of the subparagraphs there, from memory, talks about having to estimate the other side's costs of disclosure. Um, apart from guesswork. How do you approach that question? Um, that's always, in fact, that's that's a, a, a tricky question and some of the authorities uh, do, do express that. But uh, as difficult as it is, um, the purpose of the Act, sorry, the purpose of the practice note uh, is to force the parties to determine um, why it's necessary to get those documents and how voluminous and time-consuming it's going to take uh, to get those documents, and you will simply have to do the best you can. Um, uh, and if I can put it as loosely as that, um, you do have to go to some um, length of identifying what those costs are because it will formulate effectively um, how difficult and time consuming you are going to be um, putting another party to the task of uh, collating documents. Yeah, and I guess to some extent it's then up to the other side to put on evidence which you can test. Well, correct, and, and you can have a, have a debate about that, yeah. um, definitely. Well, with that, um, I'll hand over to my colleague, Michael, who will deal with the more practical aspects of uh, Practice Note 11. Thanks, Dinesh. Um, thank you to Scott for chairing and for all of you uh, for attending this evening in various forms. Um, so I'm going to be covering some of the practical uh, tips in terms of preparing an application um, for disclosure under the practice note and then some of the related issues. Uh, so for example, um, engaging experts and also um, subpoenas and notices to produce. Um, people often um, don't necessarily consider the practice note um, in respect to those issues. Uh, so one thing that I'd suggest is start with the very basics. And what I haven't put on that slide is that um, the application needs to be by way of notice of motion and supporting affidavit or affidavits. And I'll talk about the relevant um, deponents for those affidavits um, in respect to different types of cases later on in the presentation. In terms of um, one of the threshold requirements, um, as Dinesh referred to earlier, under paragraph four of the practice note, it's necessary for the resolution of the real issues in dispute in the proceedings. And Justice McDougall um, covered this at some length in the Leighton case that Dinesh referred to. Um, that was an interesting judgment, um, not least of which we because of the proximity with which um, it was delivered uh, to the release of the practice note. And Justice McDougall took on the task of combining um, initially three matters, um, but then reduced it down to two um, it, and addressed some universal issues in respect of the application of the practice note. In respect of the Hodges matter, which was one of the two, the subject of the ultimate judgment, Hodges was a former employee of um, Leighton and he was alleged to have breached his fiduciary duties in respect of the construction of a, a barge. Um, there uh, was consideration by his honour of the extensive internal and external investigations um, that Leighton undertook um, before making the application for disclosure and ultimately found that um, disclosure was not necessary under paragraph four of the practice note um, because essentially Leighton already had uh, the information it needed to define the issues in dispute in the proceedings. Um, one thing that you should consider um, with an application also is the risk of duplication of proceedings if you don't um, resolve all of the issues in dispute. Um, and 
uh, also the court's resources and the costs that will be involved for um, parties and potential parties if there are then um, uh, proceedings later on if, if all the issues aren't dealt with. In terms of tips for formulating your application, um, an assessment of the real issues in dispute really needs to begin with the pleadings. I know that sounds basic, but um, people can often draft pleadings and um, quite a ways down the track when you're looking at an application, you forget um, how the various issues in the pleadings are crafted, um, how the interplay between the various paragraphs of the pleadings and certain defined terms um, interact, and um, really go through that in detail to work out um, firstly what the issues are uh, disclosed in the, um, in the pleadings. Uh, the next um, point of call is the evidence if there's been any uh, surf to date. There might have already been an interlocutory stoush, for instance, before you get to this point. Um, and uh, also consider any um, requests or answers for particulars um, that might have been exchanged between the parties. Um, those things are all going to be helpful to, to firstly identify what the real issues in dispute are. The um, next suggestion I would make is in terms of a logical presentation of um, classes or if you'd like to call them categories in your application. Um, it's often helpful to set it out in the schedule in your application and have some reference between um, the class of documents or category um, and next to that the uh, relevant issue in dispute that you think that goes to. And you can undertake some cross-referencing exercise if you need to with the court. Um, in terms of um, one of the criteria that uh, Dinesh referred to in terms of um, uh, establishing ex exceptional circumstances, you need to go into detail about um, logical reasoning as to why documents will be in um, only the respondent's possession. Um, immediate examples jump out like cases of oppression where um, directors are being shut out from uh, the usual managerial processes um, of a corporation. Um, they uh, access to things like bank accounts have been suspended, email addresses, um, internal um, correspondence has been kept from them. Um, the next point of call is section 56 and um, have a look at how you are um, crafting your application and the tone of it within the context of the just, quick and cheap uh, resolution of the proceedings. And it might be that after you read the wording of that section, you then reconsider how you, your application is pitched. One thing that people often fall foul of is obvious privileged issues. And that might mean um, that you simply carve out certain um, correspondence by way of uh, date range, for instance. Proceedings start on a particular date. Um, and beyond that date, there will be correspondence with um, the the uh, relevant parties, solicitors and, and counsel. Another easy way is to carve out recipients. And I'll talk more about carve outs um, in a moment. Uh, and uh, more to um, Dinesh's discussion on um, costs, uh, you need to have a realistic and considered estimate of costs. This will go to the issue of burden, which is often raised by respondents in these applications. Um, one way to do it is um, similar to a security costs application. You can set out a schedule with uh, different elements and your estimate of who would be undertaking um, the various um, steps. Um, and when I say realistic, a partner is not going to do all of this work at a law firm. So um, don't be putting down you know, $560 an hour for reviewing um, documents provided by a client. The court is going to see through that immediately. Um, so, uh, and like all opinion evidence, you need to um, provide the relevant experience of the deponent. I know this sounds basic, but it, it's sometimes uh, where these types of affidavits fall down. 
Um, if it's a solicitor with 25 years experience in commercial litigation, fantastic, put that information in the affidavit. Um, again, with section 56, um, and I'll, I'll reiterate this point, you should attempt to negotiate classes or categories of documents um, in open correspondence um, when you're first um, contemplating an application for disclosure. People often refer to this type of correspondence as love letters to the court, um, and that's because the ultimate audience, if this correspondence makes its way um, into the court book, will be the judge. So your correspondence needs to be um, considered, it should be consistent, and also reasonable. That is, your correspondence should reflect the classes or categories of documents that ultimately you would prepare to stand up in court and argue for. Um, it's not necessarily um, a negotiation where you're willing to um, set out very broad categories which you then use as a negotiating chip, um, chip to, um, to get what you really want. Um, you should also consider if the negotiation uh, it, it is um, perhaps stalling is sending the draft um, application to the other side to really frame the other side's focus as to what you'll be pressing the court for. Um, one way to increase the chances of success for your application is to um, limit the breadth um, of the classes to what is um, necessary. There are very practical ways to do this. As I mentioned, um, dates are very important. If you know that a particular crucial um, factual element of your case happened on a particular day, then you can limit it to that day. If you think that it happened within the space of a couple of months, limit it to those two months. Another good way is by entities, whether that be corporate or um, individual, and you can also do it by way of um, the capacity in which those people act. There might be multiple capacities in which individuals act, for instance, and you can say, for example, if an individual is a trustee, um, certain correspondence that was sent um, in the capacity as trustee. You can limit um, your classes by way of accounts, and that doesn't necessarily mean bank accounts. It could be um, internal um, accounts which have specific numbers. Um, it can be email addresses, um, very uh, specific, sometimes people have multiple email addresses and you don't want all of their email addresses for all the subsidiary companies. Uh, you can also do it by file type and I'll talk more about that um, when we come to discuss uh, forensic IT experts. As we discussed, one of the um, key elements of, um, of being successful in one of these applications is anticipating the issue of burden that will almost ultimately be raised by the respondent. How is the respondent practically going to locate these documents? Are they physical? Are they stored somewhere off site? Um, are they electronic? Are they amongst a, a server of, um, of many, many other documents of, of similar type or, or style or size? And um, you should consider electronic um, disclosure and whether that could be used practically by the other side in order to re reduce the burden um, and um, discuss with a forensic IT specialist how that might be done. Now this might come down to um, an issue of advocacy but um, it is important to be consistent with language and your defined terms. Now you can start um, with the pleadings and um, that might translate into the evidence, it may not, um, but uh, it's important to have some consistency between the pleadings and the application for obvious reasons. There might be um, very um, defined terms in, um, in respect of the documents or the issues in, in dispute and make sure they're consistent um, throughout your submissions also so that you are the point of reference um, for, for the court. Now, in terms of engaging experts on the substantive issues in the case, 
One thing that experts are really helpful with is the initial and very specific guidance about um, what documents they will require in order to form their opinion or upon which their assumptions will be based. And it might be that you can save a lot of time and expense for your client because um, disclosure might not actually be necessary at all like you <coughs> consulted uh, with your expert. And it might be as simple as a phone call to them. Um, experts are also very helpful in uh, helping you draft classes or categories of documents. And that's because unless you've had experience in a particular industry or discipline or profession before, you will not be savvy with the technical language that they use, their vernacular, their jargon, the types of documents that they often use. Engineers, for instance, um, will often use DWG files and the specific expert will be able to give you guidance not only on the types of documents that they use, but the formats that they save them in, whether or not there's an industry practice um, for particular documents, um, what programs they regularly use to create these documents <coughs> or store them, for instance, and um, importantly, how they're used by um, the subject uh, business or, or professional. Um, in terms of the deponents for affidavits to support your application, an expert um, can be uh, helpful. It, it might be worthwhile um, to limit, and al although it's not likely, any opportunity for cross-examination by putting it on um, by a solicitor on information and belief. It's only an interlocutory application, so that's fine. And it will enhance um, your ability to demonstrate um, necessity um, relevance and exceptional circumstances. Now, I'm not sure um, who has met a forensic IT expert. They're very interesting people. Um, I hope you have the pleasure at some point. The uh, federal court practice note speaks to um, great lengths about um, electronic discovery, its virtues and the consideration by the parties of employing it and its benefits. Um, it, there's a reason for that. You should consider getting an affidavit from a forensic IT expert early on in your preparation um, for an application for disclosure under the practice note because they can be very helpful in um, giving you guidance um, not only about the cost of electronic discovery um, potentially for the other side, but also some very practical um, uh, issues. One issue that's often thrown up by parties in responding to an application for disclosure is futility. And um, they can throw their hands up in the air and say, well, that's all very good, but all those documents have been destroyed or deleted. Forensic IT experts are very good in um, being able to tell you based on um, different parameters, whether or not there is a likelihood that the documents still exist and that they can be recovered and um, produced, um, particularly in, in terms of deleted documents. And we'll get to that in a second. The other thing that they can um, assist you with, as we've already discussed, is the time and the cost of, um, or the likely time and cost of the respondent um, complying with the orders that you seek. I know that, again, this sounds basic, but you should go back to first principles and go to the dictionary at the very end of the Evidence Act after the schedules and look at the definition of document. I'll read it for you because it's very worthwhile. Document means any record of information and includes A, anything on which there is writing, or B, anything on which there are marks, figures, symbols, or perforations having a meaning for persons qualified to interpret them, or C, anything which sounds, images, or writings can be reproduced or without the aid of anything else, or D, map, plan, drawing, or photograph. That means that um, you can forget about paper necessarily. It is much, much broader than that you need to consider whether metadata or deleted documents are relevant to your proceedings. This often comes up in um, breach of fiduciary duty cases, um, misuse of confidential information, um, 
things like that. Now, everyone's probably heard the term um, fishing expedition um, in the context of a very, very broad uh, subpoena or notice of juice that you've um, received or, or come across, um, but particularly in terms of the argument about impermissibility um, under the general um, rules for subpoenas and notice of juice. But you may not have thought about that in the context of the practice note. And there's often confusion um, I've experienced between what is and what is not in, um, permissible in terms of issuing subpoenas and notices to produce in the equity division. So let's um, start off with what is not permissible. Subpoenas and notices to produce might be considered um, an abusive pro process or um, subversive in terms of the practice note. Um, a key case in this area is the case that Dinesh referred to owner strata plan and um, baseline constructions. Now in that case, um, Barron was one of the owners in the strata plan and there was an allegation uh, for various reasons which you can read in terms of the operation of the Home Building Act that Barron engaged um, and entered into a direct contract with the builder in that matter. But relevantly, there was a strikeout application um, on foot which turned on this issue about whether or not there was a contract directly between Barron and the builder. And in terms of the um, assessment of um, exceptional circumstances, Justice Stevenson um, held ultimately that the strikeout application and its impact um, was an exceptional circumstance which justified uh, the um, production of the documents sought by the applicant in that case. And what Justice um, Stevens had said more broadly was that it would subvert the intended operation of the practice note if parties could avoid its operation by adopting the expedient of serving a notice to produce rather than seeking an order for disclosure. Indeed, if a notice to produce was served with the object of avoiding the operation of the practice note, such service might well constitute an abuse of the court's process. They're not light words. The next case that we're going to consider is this interesting matter of Reinhardt and Reinhardt. I'm sure you've seen various iterations of the litigation in the newspaper. And um, this one, although on an interlocutory matter, is equally as juicy. And there's some very interesting um, context about it. This uh, Stoush in um, the broader context involved three subpoenas um, issued by one of Gina's daughters, um, Bianca. Uh, they were to two corporate entities and um, one to uh, Barnaby Joyce. The um, broad flavour of the subpoenas though was to find out um, through documents requested information about donations that were made to these two corporate entities and, uh, and Mr. Joyce. One of the corporate entities was the um, organisation uh, which was a, well, colloquially known as a, a conservative think tank um, and Gina had recently been appointed as some kind of lifetime member. Um, Mr. Joyce was more interesting in that um, Gina had presented him with a $40,000 prize, um, a cheque, at the National Agriculture and Related Industry Day. I'm not sure what that is, um, and I don't know that Mr. Joyce did either. Um, but anyway, there were a number of interlocutory applications which were outstanding at the time that this application was considered. But relevantly, um, uh, Her Honour took into account the fact that Bianca was making an application um, for um, derivative um, action under Section 247A of the Corporations Act um, in respect of um, various actions that were taken um, by individuals, including Gina, in respect of HPPL and um, these donations that were made and allegations of breaches of director's duties. 
Now, Bianca asserted that these um, three subpoenas were permissible and that they didn't breach the practice note because um, they uh, had a legitimate uh, forensic purpose in that uh, she wanted these documents in order to establish um, good faith under the relevant test under Section 247A of the Corporations Act. And there's a very long discussion about um, the forensic purpose in, in the judgment, which I'll let you read. Um, Justice Ward, though, said um, more generally, more recently has been said that the subpoena will be an abusive process uh, where it is used as a means of obtaining disclosure of documents which, in accordance with paragraph 4 of the practice note, could only be obtained before the service of evidence in exceptional circumstances necessitating disclosure. So we see those um, key elements that uh, Dinesh discussed there. Importantly, um, Her Honour assessed the context of all the interlocutory applications and um, specifically the application at hand under section 247A and said, well, um, understand all the submissions in respect of the practice note, but all of the evidence in chief uh, for that application being the relevant application had already been served. So in that sense, um, the um, practice note uh, was, not, um, was not subverted by these three subpoenas. Notwithstanding that, um, there was a considerable um, removal of categories from what uh, Her Honour found were, to, were very broad uh, subpoenas. Uh, now, in terms of um, metaphors that we can throw around, pick your battles and save your ammunition. What you need to do is to establish um, necessity and exceptional circumstances for this application, and that requires merit. What you don't want to do is waste your client's time and costs um, by uh, having interlocutory stouches um, for subpoenas and notices to produce um, that are liable to be set aside uh, by way of notice of motion as an abusive process. Uh, your client might give you very strong instructions about wanting um, certain documents very early on in a matter. Can I suggest um, that it would be more worthwhile to your clients to take a very um, considered approach and perhaps save your ammunition for an application for disclosure after your evidence is um, served. And again, attempt to negotiate classes um, early before making any application. Now, we get on to um, what is permissible to try and clear up um, some of this confusion. Take a common sense approach. As has been borne out in the authorities that Dinesh and I have discussed, um, you need to step back, read um, the subpoena or notice to produce that you've drafted, and um, really have a practical think about whether or not the other side is going to jump up and down about um, the nature of the documents you requested or the breadth of it. In North Coast Transit, uh, Justice Black said, in my view, a subpoena issued to a third party requiring the production of four identified documents would not, in the ordinary course, be inconsistent with the objectives of the practice note such that it could be characterised as subverting those objectives. In that case, um, it concerned only four um, contracts with successful tenderers um, with the Department of Transport in New South Wales. Um, these were uh, bus companies. And His Honour um, took uh, respectfully quite a practical approach and said, well, look, really, it's only four contracts. Um, doesn't subvert the practice note. Um, also, you need to consider the party that you're issuing the subpoena to. Um, if it's a third party and the request is not in the nature of discovery, um, then it's unlikely to fall within the practice note. And the authorities um, there, Westgate Finance and May, just, Justice McDougall's judgment. Now, in terms of notices to produce, of course, um, there's the two relevant provisions under the UCPR. There's Rule uh, 21.10 in terms of inspection, and there is Rule 34.1 in terms of um, production to court. 
uh, Rule 21.10, subsection 1. There's two um, sections there that are relevant. A is any document or thing that is referred to in any originating process, pleading, affidavit, or witness statement. And then, uh, sorry, filed or served by party B. And subsection B is obviously quite a lot broader. Any other specific document or thing that is clearly identified in the notice and is relevant to a fact and issue. Um, can I suggest that A is probably um, more narrow and less likely uh, to subvert the practice note? You should also um, read carefully Rule 34.1 as it can be considered much broader and look at the authorities that we've discussed in terms of the permissibility of subpoenas because they're quite um, similar. Um, all right, we've covered it quite a bit, but are there any questions? Yes? If a document has been deleted, will it fall within an order for disclosure and how likely is it that it can be recovered? Right, well, the first point of call is to go back to um, the definition of a document under the Evidence Act. So if we go back, um, if you look at C, anything from which sounds, images, or writings can be reproduced with or without the aid of anything else. Now, um, arguably, a deleted document might be able to be recovered. Um, and this is where you get to speak to our interesting people, the forensic IT experts. They will tell you, well, it depends. And as I've discovered lately in a very long running federal court discovery stoush, that depends on many different factors. They will ask you some very targeted questions um, which you will need instructions on. And it's, it's actually quite practical. For example, um, the document might have been deleted from um, a cloud-based server. Now, um, that, depending on the server and um, your access to it, um, may still be recoverable or it may not be. You might also have something much more specific like a USB or another solid state um, uh, external storage device. And um, although it might have, say, um, a one terabyte storage capacity. That might be used for very large files very often. For example, video files, depending on the nature of the work or you know, the, the use of that um, external storage device. And the deleted document, although um, deleted in the colloquial sense, all of the data might still be on that storage device depending on its use and whether or not the data has been overwritten. The only thing that may have been deleted is what's called link files which tells um, the relevant computer where the, the disparate parts of data for that document sit within the storage device. And um, this is highly relevant for um, your disclosure application because your IT expert can say, that's the device that was used, this is how it was used, and this is my opinion about the likelihood of recovery and the ease with which we can do it and the cost. Any other questions? Thanks very much. Thank you, Michael. Um, just before we close, can I just check that there's no other questions? I guess if there's a couple of um, takeaway messages from tonight, uh, they are the focus that needs to be brought to the precise wording of the practice note and in particular the concepts of exceptional circumstances and necessary and uh, what is to be included in the affidavits. Uh, thank you very much to both Dinesh and to Michael for the clarity with which they've made this presentation. You will find the slides uh, on the website uh, if they're not there already, they'll be there very shortly. Um, and with that, I thank you all very much for attending, both those here and those virtually, and wish you all a good evening. Thank you.